Good afternoon, and thanks to all of you for coming to this book event. I'm Raihan Salam, president of the Manhattan Institute, and I'm excited to be here with Isaac Stone Fish. Isaac is the founder and CEO of Strategy Risk, and he is the author of America Second, How America's Elites Are Making China Stronger, which just came out this week. This is a striking book for a number of reasons. Uh, it explains what China wants from its relationship with the US, how it tries to achieve its goals, and how American elites have all too often gone along. In Fish's view, China envisions America as a pliant second fiddle as it rises to global dominance, and he singles out prominent individual Americans, big companies, and even entire industries for giving into pressures from the Chinese Communist Party. Then he urges America to have a more serious debate about how we should resist those pressures. But before we get to skewering the elites, Isaac, I wanted to start with a question about you. You've been writing about China for some time and even lived there for a time. And in the book, you're not shy about admitting that this involved some compromises on your part. Can you tell us a little bit about your work and your experiences of self-censorship and explain why China's leaders are able to exert such power even over independent-minded foreign journalists? I started going to China just over 20 years ago now and studied it throughout college and moved there in my 20s. It felt like the right place to go and, and freelance. And I think at the time it was. And th there were so many walls in place, so many structures of conversations, of the ways that we talked about China that you just started thinking that those were the truth. My first year Chinese class at Columbia we learned the word production brigade before we learned how to say sleep or eat. You know, we learned comrade very, very early, just about the same time we learned mister. And when you were in China, you just assumed that there were certain things that you didn't talk about. And it was only after leaving, I lived there for six years, left about a decade ago. It's only after leaving that you realized, oh, you can actually talk about these things. And there's these, what they call hidden rules about not mentioning certain things about Tibet or Tiananmen Square or the status of Taiwan or much later Xinjiang. And you just get to learn, you get to think in those thought patterns. And I also, I don't want to absolve myself of the responsibility. I mean, some of it was, oh, I'm afraid that if I criticize this person or criticize this party entity, maybe I wouldn't get a visa, maybe I'd have trouble doing reporting. And so some of it was you know, intellectual cowardice. And we can go into that in a little bit more detail, but a lot of it is these systems of language and speech. I wonder, Isaac, to what extent was that a reflection of a broadly liberal education being, um, you know, a young person at a time of American cultural self-confidence uh, and just thinking that that kind of deference that you're describing was essentially a way of being polite, uh, a way of being respectful of perhaps what you at that point thought of as a distinct tradition and not wanting to be a kind of blundering Westerner? One of Mao Zedong's brilliances was turning on its head this idea of Confucian deference and being intensely critical of elders, forcing people to self-criticize, to write these letters, to express all of their faults. And I, I think the we all both live within a cultural context, but then can push outside of it. And I think in some cases, yes, you can say it's polite not to criticize the Chinese Communist Party or the Chinese government, but then it's also in some ways, you, you need to not abandon your values once you leave the country. Two central American institutions that have been struggling with, that have been managing um, CCP influence are Hollywood and academia. Why is it that China exerts such power over these domains, but not quite as much in other areas? Uh, as you note in the book, also, there's a, there's a difference between television and the movie business uh, regarding how sensitive they are um, to angering the CCP. So, so yeah, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that as well. Beijing's focus has been on changing the way that Americans think and talk about China, as opposed to say Russia, which is chaos for chaos's sake. It's in some ways more similar to how Israel exerts influence. It's about what Americans think and talk about Israel. It's not about other greater issues. And Academia and Hollywood, and I would argue especially Hollywood, uh, has conditions ripe for Beijing to be able to exert influence to change the way that Hollywood works. And for Hollywood, it was this very long process of teaching Hollywood executives how they would be rewarded 
if they portrayed China in a way that Beijing felt positive and how they'd be punished if they did so in a way that was negative to Beijing. And it's, it's very specific. It's not, I try to be very careful not to say, oh, they were offending Chinese people or they weren't offending Chinese people because just like basically every other country in the world, there's a huge variety of opinions in China about what is offensive and what is not. And the Communist Party does not speak for Chinese people. It just likes to say it does. So the party will have these ideas of what is quote unquote offensive that will shift depending on the era and depending on which party member. And Beijing has excelled at communicating those to Hollywood and training and develop inside the mind of many Hollywood producers and executives this idea, this sort of this little naggling voice saying, oh, would this offend China? And if so, I shouldn't say it. I um, wonder, there's been a big conversation about both the movie industry and the idea that the globalization of the marketplace, uh, you know, the fact that there's incredible risk, you know, when you think about some of these larger trends, the idea that you're moving to, uh, you know, these endless movie franchises based on familiar IP, but it's also connected to the idea that, you know, we must serve the Chinese audience. This is absolutely essential. Um, so, so you just introduced an interesting idea because I think that one thing you hear is that, well, this is about not offending Chinese consumers that's a very lucrative business, uh, and that is the imperative here. But then you're introducing this other idea, which is that the CCP actively wants to conflate the idea of the party and its imperatives with Chinese consumers, Chinese people writ large. Can you talk to us a bit about that blurring of lines? Surely there's something to the idea that Chinese consumers you know, are going to be more receptive to you know, kind of one kind of content than another. I wonder how you think about that. So just like some Americans like to watch content that's offensive to them, uh, some Chinese do as well. There's, if China were a democracy, there'd be so many untapped market segments of different ways of satirizing China, of being very intensely cruel, perhaps, to the party or certain Chinese officials. And one of the reasons I wrote this book was I saw in a Chinese movie theater the film Wolf Warrior 2, which is this embarrassingly jingoistic Rambo on steroids about uh, a Chinese special forces operative saving Africa almost single-handedly. And the film begins with this Chinese army dude uh, fighting back against rapacious Chinese real estate developers in a way that no American studio would touch because it's portraying some form of entity in China in a negative light. And so if one of the most patriotic Chinese movies of the last decade is more critical of the CCP than any American movie of the last decade, uh, well, then we have a problem. Interesting. So it's almost a matter uh, of, you know, provided you've established your, you know, patriotic bona fides, or rather your kind of, uh, you know, willingness to uh, serve the regime, then you're allowed to, you know, strike a dissenting note on this or that, or just kind of surface the fact that, you know, it's all, it's not all hunky dory, you know, you, you can introduce provided, you know, you kind of, um, you know, are on the right team, so to speak. It's funny, it's, it's even less that and it's more that oftentimes you can criticize Beijing and keep your integrity intact. It's just people don't do it because of the risk. And there's not an even meeting out of punishment. Um, th there's this fascinating, obscure Mr. Bean movie where he goes and humiliates the Chinese premiere. I think it came out in 2014. Absolutely nothing happened. Mr. Bean is still incredibly popular in China. The movie is obscure, but it was, you know, it's a Rowan Atkinson movie. It didn't disappear without a trace but no one paid any attention to it. It didn't cause any backlash that we can see. Uh, and that was a movie that was critical of the party. You know, it wasn't made in Hollywood, it was made in the UK. I think the issue is that uh, studios bend over further than they need to, you know, further than backwards, so to speak, because they're afraid of what has happened in certain well-publicized cases. But so they don't want to be the edge case. Yeah. They want to stay very far away from that and therefore they're just not remotely critical. Exactly, exactly. I wonder, um, you know, you have spent quite a bit of time in higher education, also, you know, looking at Chinese influence over Chinese leverage over elite institutions. And I'll just say anecdotally, I hear constant stories from people at institutions ranging from, you know, kind of 
small, not especially selective, um, you know, public universities to the kind of most elite, elite, elite universities. And all these are, are places where I think that there was almost a celebratory, um, you know, sense that, uh, you know, Chinese revenue is going to be this lifesaver, uh, you know, even the anthropology department, you know, hey, we'll be able to, you know, you'll be fully funded because we have, you know, this kind of revenue from from Chinese students. Uh, and now it's becoming a more contentious political issue as well. You see a number of people, particularly on the right, talking about, um, you know, the idea of Chinese foreign students being used as a diplomatic weapon by the Chinese Communist Party, and therefore talk, and it varies in terms of, you know, how broad it is, how extreme it is, but talk about, you know, barring Chinese foreign students in the most extreme case, we're saying, you know, barring the family members of party members, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is definitely becoming uh, an intense issue. I wonder, what do you see as the sources of leverage and power? How much of it is tuition revenue? How much of it is access uh, to China for people who are students of China, it seems that it's going well beyond academic sinologists, uh, you know, kind of uh, area study scholars. It seems like it's affecting many, many other fields of study as well. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts. It definitely has. And it, it's an area we have to be very careful of because one of the reasons why U.S. educational institutions are among the best in the world, if not the best in the world, is because they are quite open both to ideas and foreign students. And there's so many absolutely brilliant Chinese students and frankly, like plenty of mediocre Chinese students who deserve to come here as well. So we need to be having this conversation with the goal of maintaining that access. The issue is that Beijing is comfortable using Chinese students as leverage and saying, oh, if this school does something we don't like, it's no longer an approved school for Chinese students to go to. Which can be devastating, which can be economically devastating for, for a certain, yeah. You know. Definitely, definitely. I mean, there are schools in the United States that have you know, 10, 20 plus percent of Chinese students, and in some ways that's wonderful. In other ways, it just gives Beijing a lot of leverage over them. I think what universities need to do is be a lot more careful and discerning with the partnerships that they form with various Chinese institutions. Tufts University publicly, after a lot of pressure from local students, ended its partnership, ended its partnership, but said it was doing so in order to double down with a in Beijing. So I wonder, um, Confucius uh, Institutes have been a real flashpoint. It's one of these, um, you know, pieces of the U.S.-China relationship that has become particularly visible, particularly for folks on the right. Um, and, you know, there have been moves to, uh, you know, ban Confucius Institutes from U.S. universities. You um, are not quite on that bandwagon, though you are very concerned about Chinese influence over U.S. higher education. So, so tell us why. What is it that the critics of Confucius Institutes aren't getting quite right about them? Americans need to learn Chinese. And if Beijing weren't as repressive as it were today, pandemic, so uh, overreacted to there, I strongly encourage American students to go there. But they need to find some way of going and learning Chinese. And until the U.S. government, because in this case, it probably will have to be the U.S. government, steps in and provides alternate equal sources of funding and sources of, of Chinese teaching, I think they're the best to worst option that we have. One thing that is that seems challenging when it comes to that higher education landscape. So, you know, this idea that, look, um, to celebrate Chinese culture to believe in comedy, um, you know, deep mutual relationships and cultural exchange with the Chinese people does not have to mean uh, deferring to the Chinese Communist Party. That to me seems like, a, you know, an idea that, you know, you've advanced in this book, you've advanced that through, you know, much of your public writing. But, you know, that's the kind of thing where you'd think, well, there's got to be philanthropic support for that. But when you look at some of the most prominent visible philanthropists who are working on U.S.-China relations, uh, you oftentimes have uh, people who've made their fortunes in China. Uh, you oftentimes have pe uh, people of Chinese origin who are vulnerable to Chinese pressure, uh, you know, economic and otherwise. Um, and, you know, some of these people are becoming very important philanthropists here in the United States. Um, 
I, I wonder, what do you see as the source for supporting um, this work on, you know, Chinese language instruction, um, supporting cultural exchange that's not in that same kind of vulnerable, exposed relationship with the party? You know, because if it's not going to come from, I mean, just to name names, if it's not going to come from Joe Tsai, you know, for example, or, you know, kind of other people who've kind of, you know, made their fortunes, um, people who are bi-continental, you know, kind of, jet set folks, uh, but who, you know, definitely need to be on the Chinese Communist Party's good side. If it's not them, who will be the people who will invest in this and, and who will, you know, kind of, um, you know, have their skin in the game for it? I've been very hopeful at how George Soros has turned on China and the Chinese Communist Party over the last several years. There also are a lot of wealthy folks who, in part because they have business ties there, like to stay very, very quiet with what they do, but who are trying to fund various ventures in this case. It's a very, very difficult thing to do because it, it's sort of, you know, I have so many conversations with people about, you know, can you build a hospital in Xinjiang, the region in Northwest China where upwards of a million Muslims are in concentration camps? Um, it's tough. I mean, the region needs better hospitals and you're supporting a genocide. So how do you choose on that? I think the where a lot of this will come from has to be probably either the government on one side or very grassroots on the other side. I'm very heartened by the tone that I've seen from student organizations that are pushing for divestment from stocks and investments that support uh, the party in pernicious ways or support the genocide in Xinjiang, because they do seem to be doing this from... I hate to use the word inclusive, but, uh, you know, from a much more inclusive and I would argue ethical way. And so it's not about against China, anti-China, it's about anti-party and how do we, quote unquote, engage with Chinese people without falling into these united front traps that we've been in for the last couple of decades. You've closely followed um, the Chinese influence controversies in Australia. And I kind of sometimes think that they're, you know, several years ahead of us. Of course, they're much more vulnerable for all sorts of reasons, economic and otherwise. Uh, but, you know, it does seem like that's an environment where the party's tactic has been to say that if you criticize the regime, you criticize the party, you are in fact demonizing and attacking members of the Chinese diaspora, Chinese Australians. And that just seems like something that, you know, is a recurring theme through the book the danger of that, um, the power of that argument, but particularly in a moment when Americans, um, you know, particularly a lot of our elite discourse um, really centers around questions of racial justice and racial representation. And it really does seem as though the party has quite shrewdly deployed those arguments, arguments, uh, you know, using the language of cultural appropriation, um, you know, just anti-colonialism, um, anti-racism uh, in order to advance the idea that, uh, you know, basically there's no distinction to be made between the party's interests, the party's sensitivities, uh, and those of people of Chinese origin. Uh, I, I wonder, you know, how do you see that unfolding in some other countries that are dealing with rising Chinese influence? And what do you think we can learn from their experiences? It's a great point. There is a real issue in the United States about anti-Asian hatred. And what I've seen in Australia and other places, they just have such different racial dynamics. And I, I think the lesson for Australia is we should be very grateful that we have a far freer media when it comes to issues of libel than Australia, the United Kingdom, even France, because a lot of these issues are powerful you know, Americans or Australians often, and frankly, I would argue most of the time, who are not of Chinese heritage, who are doing things that are unethical and in some cases allegedly illegal. And being able to call out these people in the UK, in the US, in the United States is a very effective way of doing it. And it's a very effective way of doing it, making it clear that it's not about Chinese Americans, Chinese Australians most of the time. It's about individual Australians, Americans, and Brits and their freedom from. There is a perception that I've encountered, particularly among uh, Chinese Americans, that, uh, and you know, these are always generalizations, but that there are almost these cohort differences between, um, you know, certainly here in New York City, uh, if you look at the, you know, what was the Cantonese speaking establishment that was very closely tied to uh, Taiwan, 
uh, you know, the, the cause of the Republic of China writ large, uh, and then this kind of new uh, group of people who are Mandarin speaking, in some cases more affluent, uh, and certainly have stronger, tighter diasporic ties to China. Um, you know, it seems that for this cause of um, being anti-party, uh, really kind of resisting its power, its efforts to extend its power into our own American institutions, that it would be, you know, that's extremely important to foreground uh, people of Chinese descent, Chinese Americans, Chinese emigres. Um, but it's also the case, I've spoken to journalists, I've spoken to Chinese journalists who say that, well, I would try to seek asylum, except I have my family there. And that actually is something that really limits me, constrains me. So I wonder about that. I mean, do you feel as though there are uh, many uh, Chinese emigres, Chinese Americans who are not speaking precisely because of that kind of vulnerability? I think that's very well said. So many have families that, that you can describe as hostages. And so many also have a lot of great business opportunities that they don't want to forego. So many have family members in the party who are vulnerable if they start speaking out. It's much more difficult. There are so many Chinese Americans who know so much more about the situation, have so much more skin in the game, uh, and have you know, very meaningfully critical views of the party, but don't speak about it publicly. And I think that's a shame. I, it, it's it's difficult. You, you don't want to fault them for doing it because they have a lot more to lose than I do. You know, I, I have very limited exposure to China right now. And it's sad that I can't go back, but I've made my peace with that. Whereas you know, for folks who have family there, it's much more challenging. Can you um, tell us a bit about some of the, um, you know, you describe people like Jimmy Carter, Henry Kissinger, really celebrated um, members of the American establishment uh, who have been in some respects seduced by the CCP and its influence. You know, when you're talking about people who are that prominent, um, you know, what is it that the CCP has been able to do to bring them into its orbit? Kissinger has a notoriously monumental ego. And Various Chinese leaders, starting from Zhou Enlai to Mao, all the way up to Xi Jinping, have in a very, very sophisticated manner managed to convince Kissinger that by supporting China, he is at his rightful place at the center of the world. They do that arguably better than, than anyone else. There's an anecdote that I quote in my book where Kissinger is talking with an official about Trump's State Visit Plus. It was 2018, you know, where they opened the, the Forbidden City to him and he gets to walk around like he's an emperor. And Kissinger says something like, well, you know, I know it worked for Trump because it worked for me. I wonder also about, uh, you know, recently we've heard quite a bit about scientists, uh, you know, researchers, people who are deciding to go to East Asia, partly because, um, you know, of, of the promise of funding, but also the sense that there's a kind of cultural and economic momentum to uh, being engaged in the sciences, um, in research, and if you're looking at artificial intelligence, hypersonics, any number of really cutting edge disciplines. How concerned should we be about that? And are there effective ways for we uh, for us to, to counter that, that kind of gravitational pull? So much of countering China is about countering Chinese propaganda. And I have a very broad definition of propaganda. So in often cases, it means putting out different American propaganda. But there's a sense that people can go to China, get a $20 million lab, and then just focus on their science. But their careers tend to have to be so intensely political. Politics dominates universities in China. Every university in China is owned and controlled by the party. And there are things that you have to do in order to maintain your, your funding, uh, your political stance. You have to be in, in some ways in lockstep with the party. So I think the more folks know about that and the less there's this perception that, oh, you go and there's a blank check and you can do whatever you want. Maybe that's the way it'll be for the first three months or six months or a year or two, but then you're going to have to start making compromises. And so when scientists can know about that, I think it's effective. I have to ask you about something that has emerged since uh, you completed your book, which is the Eileen Gu phenomenon. Uh, this is something that uh, I think um, it really hits home, you know, for a lot of Americans who are not necessarily people who, like you, have been really steeped uh, in the geopolitics, uh, you know, just really steeped in um, the kind of subtleties of Chinese influence. You know, this is 
um, you know, uh, young, attractive, dynamic, charismatic, uh, young American athlete. Uh, and uh, it just really seems like an incredible coup. Uh, of course, it's not the first time something quite like this has happened. Um, can you, is the party actively thinking about and cultivating figures like that uh, in order to, you know, boost morale and the sense of uh, China's cultural prestige and momentum? I'm not sure exactly the way that the party has worked with Eileen, but I do think you're right. It's a fantastic coup and it is a really good soft power moment. And I, I think you know, many countries around the world allow for dual citizenship. The United States does, China does not. She's been very coy about whether or not she's a U.S. citizen or a Chinese citizen. I expect what will happen here is that she'll be showcased as a pride of China, and then she'll express an opinion that is too controversial for Beijing to live in, and there'll be some sort of backlash. And, you know, that'll be sad, but it's a, a price of, of fame over there. Uh, I'm worried at how jingoistic China has become over these last several years, especially as it's been so closed off to the world. I think so many people use COVID as a legitimate reason to think that China is closed, but China is more closed today than it's been since, gosh, probably the late 70s. And I think that's very damaging. Interesting. So could it be that the public health crisis has actually been capitalized on by the regime to further restrict? Uh, and you know, I'm curious, so you think that that's part of the dynamic that's going on? I definitely do. And I, I don't think that COVID was caused in order for this to happen. I think this happened and this was seen as a very effective way to, like you said, capitalize on the crisis. You know, there, there are parts of China which I believe still require 28 days of quarantine, which is basically just a way of saying, don't come here, we don't want you. I also wonder, um, you know, it seems as though the Chinese have been, uh, excuse me, the Chinese Communist Party um, has been very shrewd about identifying wedge issues, pressure points. So, for example, early uh, in the Trump presidency, uh, you had uh, Xi Jinping uh, really embracing climate diplomacy uh, and also the idea that, you know, at Davos, that China was going to become the new center of a kind of global free trade order, that China was the, you know, kind of a, the Chinese government, you know, kind of under under his authority. Um, they were the real champions of economic openness. But, you know, this this kind of uh, this green diplomacy is particularly interesting. The idea of China as a climate leader, partly because you know, one thing that I've I've encountered is this idea that China is using environmental regulations as another instrument of social control as well. Uh, the idea that you know we are monitoring your consumption, uh, you know, as a, a kind of vehicle for actually uh, further embedding surveillance into every aspect of life, uh, is that something that uh, that you buy? Is that something that's real? I don't know how much environmental regulations are increasing social control. I always get exasperated reading about China as the patron saint of fighting climate change as their numbers continue to rise. And to see Xi Jinping get good press for saying, we're going to strongly decrease the rate of increase of our coal consumption. And so China is overwhelmingly the number one culprit. Uh, when it comes to climate change. And there's this misbelief among especially U.S. progressives that we need to overlook the negatives in the U.S.-China relationship because we must partner with Beijing to fight climate change, as opposed to thinking, well, it's very much in Beijing's interest to fight climate change. And we actually fight it more effectively if we push hard than if we yield. Talk to us a bit about trade flows and how they inform this influence conversation. Uh, you know, not long ago, people were talking about Shy America. People were talking about the kind of deep interrelationship, the idea that the United States and China had formed a kind of holistic shared economic system because we were so tightly integrated. And of course, on both the, the right and the left now, the new uh, enthusiasm is for decoupling, um, you know, which some would argue is, has so far been more theoretical than real. But I wonder, you know, how, how do you see that? Um, you know, to what extent are trade flows uh, you know, kind of inevitably associated with this kind of uh, influence you're describing, to what extent, you know, can they be separated? Uh, and, uh, and also just, you know, what do you think about the progress of decoupling so far? I would say the biggest influence trade flows have had on the debate is that they have economically incentivized certain businesses to be more, call it pro-Beijing, 
and economically disincentivize certain segments of the US population to feel the same way. Uh, there's been some really good research done out of MIT showing how disproportionate globalization's benefits uh, have fallen and how various sectors of US workers have been hit much harder by offshoring to China. So that's become a political issue. And it's actually pretty striking that it hasn't become that major of an issue, I would argue, until this midterms, when it seems like it's going to be a pretty big point. Um, John Kerry, in his short-lived presidential campaign, argued against Benedict Arnold CEOs who were pushing jobs overseas, but it didn't really bubble up in the same way, you know, even in the 2016 election, as it feels like it's going to in 2022 and, and probably in 2024. I'd say in terms of decoupling, what's happening now on the U.S. side is the U.S. government is training U.S. businesses how to manage and reduce their exposure to China. And it's happening mostly in Xinjiang, but that is almost certainly just the first step. We're going to see more withhold release orders, more regulations, more rules targeting the People's Liberation Army, arguably also the Ministry of State Security. And then perhaps at some point, it'll just be the Chinese Communist Party. And every Chinese business that has at least three people must have some form of party representation. So when you start going after the party and businesses, you're just going after business in China. There's an argument that I associate with Dan Wang, but it's made by a number of thoughtful people, which is that uh, the United States, particularly uh, under President Trump, under former President Trump, pursued a number of measures that were actually quite painful uh, for um, you know the Chinese high tech sector, um, but that it has encouraged a kind of crash drive for uh, indigenization of uh, the Chinese technology sector. And, uh, you know, there is this, uh, you know, you get what you, you know, uh, you know what I mean? You get what you wish for, um, you know, kind of thought that, hey, actually, you know, by uh, saying that you can no longer have access to certain kinds of U.S. technology, um, you are actually creating a more formidable foe uh, that, you know, decoupling could actually wind up uh, putting us in a more vulnerable position because, you know, you know, China is China. But also, if you think about a China that it has a dominant position in East Asia, which is, of course, the kind of global center of economic gravity, um, that we could wind up marginalizing ourselves and undermining our own strategic position. What do you think about that argument? I think it's more likely that we that China uses these technology with American help than without. I think it's certainly possible. It's so difficult to know the unintended consequences of these actions, but cutting them off from critical resources, you know, either slows them down or speeds them up because they have to innovate themselves. It's very difficult to know what it is. I, I think a lot of these get into the end game question. You know, what are we looking to do? Are we looking to, you know, make China a responsible stakeholder in the international system? Are we looking to ally with China against Russia or climate change or Iran or North Korea? Are we preparing for an eventual conflict with China? Are we trying to outcompete China? But having a better sense of what the goals are allow us to make better decisions in the meantime. You mentioned a number of different ways for the U.S. to approach China, for U.S. policymakers to approach China. We can do what they want and essentially become a pliant second fiddle. We can allow for our own Finlandization. Um, we can work to overthrow the party. Uh, or we can selectively push back against the CCP's most egregious behaviors. Can you lay out some of the pros and cons of each of these approaches? Uh, you know, it, I will say that right now the consensus view seems to be, um, at least you know, in terms of what people say explicitly in the political conversation, seems to be something like the third. Um, you know, there there aren't a lot of people making the case for rollback, uh, as you know, some people did vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Soviet Union you know, in the 1950s. Uh, but but anyway, I'm, I'm curious. Um, you know, I imagine you're not going to be terribly enthusiastic about the idea of becoming a pliant second fiddle, but but walk us through the three options uh, and how you see them. I think the the pliant second fiddle option is, is much more the default option. It's what will happen while we're not focusing on it. And I'm glad in, in 2001, um, Bush was going to have a very deep focus on China and then 9-11 happened and was distracted for you know, four to five years before focusing on it again with CNOC. I'm hoping nothing like that happens for so many reasons here. So I think there does need to be a focus on China. We have such a terrible record 
of regime change, um, both when we're successful and when we're not. And when the Communist Party falls, because nothing lasts forever, not even the Communist Party, it's very difficult to know if what will replace it will be better or worse, both for Chinese interests and American interests. It's very possible, for example, that if the party were to be overthrown by a Democrat, it would be much more demagogic and it would be much more anti-Japanese uh, and would go to war with Japan fairly immediately to try to shore up its legacy. There's a lot of very real grassroots hatred in China towards the Japanese. So one can imagine a more representative form of government attacking Japan in a way that would be horrifically cruel for the world. I think the, I think about this question a lot and I don't, you know, I, I feel like my answer shifts day to day. And one of the reasons why I want this to be a national conversation is because for so long, Beijing has said, um, oh, you, Henry Kissinger, you, Hank Paulson, you know, you, Jimmy Carter, you of the elite are the only ones who can understand the great bedazzled nature of the Chinese state. But we're a democracy and we need to have a conversation about what we want out of China. And it has to be, it has to move out of the elite. It has to be a national conversation. So you are being very... Um thoughtful and diplomatic, but uh, do you think that the idea of working towards uh, a post CCP China is a fool's errand? Is that something that is just, you know, kind of delusional? Or do you think that that's something that not necessarily as a formal doctrine of the US government, but that's something that our intelligence agencies, uh, you know, uh, our strategic thinkers uh, in academia, you know, should be devoting more time and attention to the idea of what it would take uh, to basically aid those forces within China that want to see um, a more democratic and open form of governance? Well, so here's the paradox. The forces in China that are far more likely to overthrow the existing order are at the top of the existing order. And they are there. We know so little about what they think that we have to subscribe the possibility that they're thinking this because that's been the case in every dictatorship that we've seen from history, <laughs> time, time beginning. The, we don't know if the other members of the Politburo Standing Committee despise Xi Jinping are right now planning to overthrow him or love and adore him and see him as the savior of China. We don't know if the two vice chairmen of the Central Military Commission are currently plotting to overthrow Xi and create a military dictatorship or a democracy, um, or if they feel like he is the best chance for China to stand up. So I, I think the, I, yeah, I'm, I'm trying not to be diplomatic here. I'm, 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 I don't know. I would love to see a China ruled by a force or a polity much much kinder than the Chinese Communist Party. I don't know what the United States can and should do about that. But I know that's an, an unsatisfying answer. Maybe oh, no, no, we're no, talking course. all. And of course, I wonder also, you know, I suppose one could argue that some kind of explicit uh, move in that direction could further reinforce the idea that liberal elements, opposition elements within China are cat's paws of some foreign power. So I suppose that's another thing to take into consideration. Um, uh, just uh, another question before we go to questions from the folks in the audience. Um, there are many people, many sophisticated people, particularly if you're looking at the kind of post-Soviet unipolar moment, uh, who were convinced that China would inevitably liberalize and democratize. That was a big part of the uh, support for permanent normal trade relations. Um, you know, the idea that uh, rising prosperity was going to lead to a kind of, um, you know, educated, literate, curious, you know, bourgeois population, and that democratization would follow. That's clearly not quite happened. And I wonder, what's your thesis as to why um, you know, that uh, consensus view among many U.S. policymakers, um, China observers, um, you know, why do they get it so wrong? So I, I talked to former Ambassador State Roy, who was in government then, and he said that everyone who was selling the policy at the time uh, knew that it was a method of selling the policy <laughs> as opposed to an actual eventuality that they believed would happen. I think it was a convenient thing for people to say and believe because it allowed them to make advantageous business decisions. I don't know how many people actually believed that 
I think what, what did Condoleezza Rice say that um, trade brings to liberalization it's an iron law. I, I think the, you know, it's very easy for me to castigate these ideas in hindsight. Um, they seem horribly naive now. I'm sure some of my ideas will seem that way in the future, but it, 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 was, it was a pretty self-serving series of viewpoints when seen in hindsight. Isaac, we have a number of questions from our audience, uh, and I will start with the following. Is the Russia-Ukrainian conflict setting the stage for a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? Russia's potential invasion of Ukraine will have a large impact on China's perception of invading Taiwan. It's very difficult to know if Beijing will decide to seize that opportunity while the United States is distracted, um, or if it'll say, well, because of this, it's better for us to wait. I think the United States has done a good job of both signaling that they're not going to be all that involved in Russia, Ukraine, while trying to increase costs on Russia, and while at the same time communicating that this is not a proxy for China's invasion of Taiwan. So just because the United States doesn't step in with Ukraine doesn't mean that we won't step in with Taiwan. I wonder when you're looking at Chinese influence in the West, um, you know, of course, you also see an incredible rise in Chinese influence in U.S. allies. You know, I'm thinking particularly of the Republic of Korea. You know, this is a place that has become uh, an incredibly dynamic exporter of its culture, you know, very affluent, sophisticated society, but also a society where, uh, you know, Chinese um, economic influence at this point, I think it's not unreasonable to say outstrips that of the United States. Uh, you know, the costs of any uh, severance of ties, any disruption of ties would be very, very high. Um, so is that something that concerns you, the idea that some of our allies in the Western Pacific are kind of drifting so far in the direction of China if, through its kind of economic gravitational pull? It does. And it, it's a remarkably similar pattern in a lot of these countries where there's a survey that came out <clears throat> last year that shows that Koreans have a less favorable view, view of Chinese than they do of both Japanese, uh, who they were occupied by, and North Koreans, who regularly promise their destruction. And so there's a elite Korean view of acquiescence towards China for business opportunities, and then more of a mainstream Korean view of frustration at, in this case, cultural appropriation, and you know this idea of sort of being Korea's big brother that is very different from what the stated elite view is. It certainly seems as though in some cases, if you look at you know uh, Malaysia and the backlash against Belt and Road that you saw there, um, you know certainly his, uh, you know in the case of Vietnam, there's kind of deep historical antagonism. So uh, you know so so perhaps one way of looking at it is that that economic influence and power in some cases is eliciting a popular backlash, but the popular backlash might not matter because of that elite, um, you know, kind of co-opting that you're describing. Is that, is that a fair character? I think so. I, I, I think that's the right overview of this. And it, you know, it so depends on the country, but I, I, I think I'm also, I'm also wary of encouraging populist backlashes because they often contain, you know, at the very least dog whistling, if not overt racial overtones. And a lot of these countries, you know, have pretty, galling histories of anti-Chinese violence, especially in Indonesia, which is going through its own reckoning now. So it's a, it's a difficult line to walk. Uh, absolutely. And, and it's interesting just when you're thinking about the CCP's kind of cultural diplomacy, when you have societies that have really had anti-Chinese pogroms, and if the Chinese Communist Party is positioning itself as the defender of, of this vulnerable minority, um, you know, that is something that you can imagine, uh, you know, kind of gains them, you know, kind of diplomatic prestige and, and you know, uh, and one can see why. Um, another question from the audience, can China's economic power be sustained without innovation and the free flow of ideas? No, without innovation. Yes, without the free flow of ideas. I, I think one can innovate in a very closed system. I, I've always thought a lot about the Sistine Chapel and the 
heavy censorship requirements placed on Renaissance painters and what they could and couldn't paint and their ability to still create masterpieces. I, I think one can innovate in a fairly closed system. And I think there's a lot of grounds in China for innovation that goes around the party or pushes against the party in a way. I don't think, I'd be very surprised if there ever, not ever, but in my lifetime, there's a free flow of ideas in China. But I, I think that's having less of an impact on innovation than we would expect. Another question from our audience from FY. What policy solutions, especially for subnational entities and officials, would you propose to effectively identify and counter China's united front operations in the U.S. and the harm they bring? For example, blurring the line between genuine civic community engagement and foreign political influence. I think I hate to say education as, as a policy solution, but I think it's really important for folks to even know what the united front is and to understand that sister city relationships between the US and China are governed by the United Front. So when your town has a partnership with Suzhou, you're amplifying the United Front. Um, so just a, a quick background on the United Front. It's a Leninist concept that he started with to strengthen British dock workers. So even though they were imperialists, we're still fighting against the received power struggle. Uh, Mao and Zhou adopted the idea added some Chinese characteristics, and now it's a very powerful ministry that seeks to strengthen China's friends and weaken its enemies. And so understanding the way that the United Front works and how to reduce that influence is directly a good way to do that. And I think we often win with transparency. So requiring understanding, requiring disclosures about the United Front, it's less even restricting or banning it and more, okay, well, this needs to be labeled as a United Front type association or with this link to the United Front and then allowing people to make their own decisions. When you look back at the COVID experience, I'm curious um, as to how you think it's shaped Chinese influence, Chinese prestige, uh, you know, just the, the kind of influence operations you describe in the book. Uh, you know, it seems as though there's been um, a shift over time, you know, obviously this is a kind of complex kind of multivocal phenomenon, but you know, one story that you hear often is that, hey, look, China shut this thing down. They used incredibly sophisticated tools. They contained it very effectively. Then look at what happened in these aging market democracies. They were completely chaotic, so polarized. Uh, you know, this was true in the United States, but also throughout the broader West. Uh, doesn't that demonstrate the superiority of the Chinese model or a more modest version of that, which is just to say, you know, we're not going to go quite that far, but we will say, gosh, that's a sign of how awfully formidable the CCP is, how, how effective they are. I wonder, do you feel like the COVID experience has been a coup for the Chinese Communist Party? I think so. Oftentimes when people praise the organization of the Chinese system, I always like to take a more extreme example with North Korea. And so it, you look at the idea through that lens. I just remember in, in World War Z how North Korea was very successful against the zombie pandemic by removing everyone's teeth. Without teeth, you couldn't bite. Perfect solution. And I, I think the people focus way too much on the COVID numbers, which come from the party any, anyway and have not been independently vetted, and far less on the forced starvations, people being locked in their home, people being severely restricted. Um, Zhang Yimou, the Olympics director for 2008, um, was saying that the only way to get people to be more organized, he was complaining about his performance at the opening ceremony, would be if they were North Korean, if we could really force them to get in line in the way that we wanted to. So there's so many much more effective ways of uh, countering COVID than the United States did. Um, the method that Chinese took, I, I would argue, broke way too many eggs for it to be a, a palatable omelet. I wanted to zero in on something we touched on earlier on, which is the question of foreign students, but also writ large, the question of Chinese immigration. Uh, you know, obviously immigration is a you know very contentious subject in the United States in general. Um, but, you know, there is a certain argument you hear. Um, if you look at, for example, the crackdowns in Hong Kong, uh, you know, Britain came forward and said, we are going to take people with British overseas passports. We are going to kind of liberalize our immigration policies for this kind of category of people for whom we had previously, uh, you know, been pretty stringent in allowing the um, uh, 
uh, you know, the kind of, you know, right to settle. Um, the United States didn't see a similar response, uh, but it, you could kind of see your argument being, or, or some version of your argument being deployed in different directions. One argument is, hey, if you're looking at foreign students, for example, um, you know, these are the tip of the spear for influence operations. Uh, this is a way in which we're facilitating the transfer of human capital from our elite institutions to, you know, kind of build a rival power. Another view is that, you know, gosh, this is an increasingly authoritarian, uh, increasingly tyrannical government. Uh, there are a lot of people who are winding up on the wrong side of these crackdowns. You know, this is an opportunity for us to have a more expansive sense. Uh, you know, let's roll out the welcome mat for kind of bright, talented Chinese um, who don't want to be under the thumb of the regime. Uh, I wonder, uh, you know, how do you see it? What do you think would be the right strategy for the U.S. to pursue? I see it in, in more of a third way in that we overemphasize the costs of things going wrong and forget about the general benefits of it. It kind of reminds me of the fact that we still take off our shoes in security because someone tried to put a, sh a bomb in their shoe 20 plus years ago. It's a massive, massive overreaction. And I think the some Chinese students are spies. Um, the vast majority are not. You know, Some will steal critical technology and bring that back to China to innovate. Uh, the vast majority will not. And I think by focusing on the negatives, but also by closing down, you know, we lose one of the advantages that we have. Even Deng Xiaoping would say that, you know, when you open the windows, you have to let some flies in. And we have to keep our windows very, very open. I would say that universities need to figure out how to work with the State Department on this. I've heard State Department folks complain that we'll have to use a hammer unless you let us use a scalpel. Uh, they need to find more targeted ways of preventing the most egregious examples of this uh, so that univers universities can stay as open as possible and, frankly, can earn as much money uh, as they so desire. You are someone who is working as a consultant. You are working with U.S. entities that are trying to figure out how to navigate this really complex landscape, the fact that there are real vulnerabilities um, that are created by China's authoritarianism for their businesses. What are some of the concerns you're hearing from people in industry about this new landscape? They are still quite afraid of offending Beijing and having some sort of online nationalist backlash against what they're doing. There's such a sense that if they knew how we were talking about China here, if they knew what we were trying to do in Xinjiang, it would have very real implications for their brand in China. Some of them are reevaluating whether they want to be in China at all because of just how much harder it is to do business there and because of the very real U.S. laws and regulations and, frankly, the safety of their U.S. employees. And then some are just trying to figure out, can they do right by both countries? And I think they're increasingly realizing that the answer to that is no, they can't. So they're trying to figure out how to decide. What are some policy solutions that you think should be pursued in order to counter Chinese influence in a thoughtful, measured way that's not going to demonize Chinese Americans, let's say? I think forced transparency. Exchange. Yeah, yeah. Forced transparency of where certain funds are coming from, um, much heavier enforcement of the Foreign Agents Registration Act and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, more debate on how the U.S. should deal with China. So some of the State Department's diplomacy on these issues, um, you know, using somewhat similar methods in the United States. And then I, I, this one's going to be more controversial. I, I do think we, we need to understand that most political speech is propaganda. People define propaganda as something someone says that I disagree with, as opposed to, you know, a, an emphatic voice, Gettysburg Address and a Trump tweet. And so understanding that um, Beijing is one of their most effective weapons is propaganda, and no matter how much we decry it. And we need to figure out both how to counter that, but also understand that, frankly, a lot of what comes out of Voice of America and Radio Free Asia can be seen as propaganda, that's not a bad thing. How do we use that effectively? We're having this uh, intense conversation about supply chain disruptions, about consumer price inflation. Uh, if you were uh, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, how would you use this moment to advance your agenda? 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm disappearing there for a second. Uh, oops. The uh, saying before, I dislocated my shoulder, so all my movements are a little bit jerkier. Um, there we go. So speaking of distractions, um, I think the, the party does excel at uh, misdirection and focusing on issues that are not germane to the debate. I think in terms of the supply chain issue, I think I would blame the United States. I would say, listen, this is an example of the U.S. being closed and being nationalistic and just look how open we are. And we would love to see more trade. We'd love to see more innovation. We'd love for your businesses to go here and then point to examples, you know, scattered examples of, of where it is true. One of the reasons the party treats Tesla so well um, is that they can say, look, we're open to business. Look at Tesla. Look, we're open to investors. Look at Goldman Sachs or Bridgewater. When that's very much not the case of the majority of the firms that are there, it's just those are showcase firms that other people can try to be like. So the measures that you're describing, uh, is it fair to say that you believe that in order to counter Chinese influence, we Americans should be prepared to expect, you know, to accept some economic pain that, you know, some kind of thoughtful decoupling is going to mean higher consumer prices in some instances. It's going to mean, um, you know, the fact that, you know, we will not have the same access to kind of low cost goods. And that's a price that we should be willing to pay because of the danger posed by China. It's, and we're paying that part. price. Yeah, we're paying that price now. And I, I think a lot of it is how it gets sold and how it gets calculated. Because I, I think the the two options are, you know, no decoupling. Well, <laughs> more than two options, but there's no decoupling. Uh, China invades Taiwan. The U.S. doesn't respond. Goods remain low. Um, or, yes, they're, they're, we, we need to defend our values. And here's alternate investments that we can make. The U.S. government has long put its money where its mouth is. And I think the idea is that for too long, China has been the center of the supply chain. And it's not, you know, let's reverse globalization. It's how do we make sure that we are very, very much more diversified out of China? So I think there's too how much. How do we mitigate the risk of dependence? Better. Exactly. Um, I believe that's all the time we have, Isaac. Thank you so much. The book, everyone, is America Second, How America's Elites Are Making China Stronger. It is a brilliant book. It is challenging. It is something that uh, will, I'm sure, prove quite controversial. Uh, Isaac has no hesitation about naming names. Uh, and uh, there's much to think about, much to discuss, much to disagree with, but also much to learn from. I have to say, I found the book quite compelling and convincing. Uh, thank you so much for your time. This has been a great conversation. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you.